What's up, you guys? Welcome to Bloom Church Online. My name is Brittany, and I get the wonderful honor and privilege of welcoming you here, introducing this message to you today. And if you're new here, you're just joining, first, I wanna give you a big, warm welcome. I'm glad that you're here, but also that we are in the middle of our sermon series called Pathways, where we are learning all about which path that we can take that's going to lead to a committed relationship with Christ and deepen our relationship and ultimately lead to everlasting life. Last week, we learned all about prayer. So if you missed it, go back, check it out. But I'm excited. I'm expectant for what God is going to do through the message this week. And I know that it's going to touch some hearts out there. So uh, get your pen and paper ready. All the holy people take notes, right? So let's go ahead and get into this week of Pathways. born and created to commune with God. You were born and created to connect with God. But here's the problem. You were raised in a fallen world. Rarely does God answer your prayers the way you thought he would. You're created to serve God. You're created to submit to the creator. You're created to follow God, which is bigger than you. If you don't serve God, that void still is there. It gets so noisy that it can crowd out God, and it's a strain to try to listen to the voice of God. You're not just some body or human being praying to a deity. You are a child of God praying to your Father in heaven. There's an intimacy there. No matter how big, ginormous of the problem you feel like you're going through, it is all the same size to God, small as a little mustard seed to him. Church! Can y'all help me welcome everybody online? What's going on, family? Looking good today. How many people caught the LA Lakers Gold State Warrior game last night? I am so excited. It's NBA season, and that's the only sport I am focusing on right now. Come on, somebody. There ain't no other games playing, right? I have a hole in my heart the size of Green Bay. (laughs) Fine. Good luck, Chiefs. Good luck. Good luck, Baltimore. I'm equal opportunity. Come on. (laughs) I love you guys. Let's get to holy things. All right, come on. We're moving on. I'm moving on. If you're new here, we are in the middle of a series called Pathways. And it's series based around this idea and understanding, similar to what my wife just talked about, about striving for holiness, living the life God called and created us to be set apart, walking in our God-given design, walking in the holiness that he commands of us. Paul says so beautifully to the church in in 2 Corinthians, he says it like this, he says, because we have these promises, what are the promises? God's with us. God wants to be our savior. God wants to be a father figure in our lives. He never leaves us. Those are the promises. He says, because we have those promises, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that could defile our body or spirit and let us work towards complete holiness because we fear God. Notice what he says here, let us work towards it which means God's not expecting perfection, but what he does desire is progression. God wants you progressing towards who you were called and created to be. There's not a standard of perfection. Listen to me. All have fallen short of his glorious standard. That means homeboy standing on the stage has fallen short many times of the glorious standard of Jesus. We all have. The difference between someone that lives a lifestyle of sin and a believer that's striving for holiness is we recognize our imperfections and we want God to work those out of us and we want to be who God called us to be. So we make a progressive choice to grow. There's a choice in our lives. It's why we call this series Pathways. We're choosing the pathways or the rhythms in our lives that help us grow towards that holiness. Peter said it like this. My wife actually read the scripture. But now you must be holy And everything you do, just as God chose you, is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I'm holy. Like, there is a standard that God wants us to live based on. 
There is a spiritual foundation God wants you to build your life on, and it is not a, a foundation of just getting to heaven. It is a foundation of the holiness you're called to live on this earth. Why? Because God's holy, but not only because God's holy, because he created you to be holy. He designed you with a perfect image. He designed you with a perfect design. He designed you to walk as a son and daughter of the Most High King. He wants you to walk in that. And there is a pathway and there is a choice we have to make. But to get there, we have to look at the Word of God the way the Word of God really is intended to look at. And here's the problem with a lot of us as believers. We look at the Bible as a self-help book, which means we pick and choose which parts of it we want to listen to. We pick and choose which parts of it we want to apply in our lives. And we also pick and choose which parts of it that we ignore or we want to discard or we want to act like it's not relevant to our lives. That's not the way the Word of God lives. The Word of God is living and active like a double-edged sword meant to cut away the muck and the morrow, all of those layers of sin and hurts and pain. And why does it cut away the muck and the morrow? The Bible says to expose who you were called and created to be, to expose the holiness inside of you which means there is a radical nature to our faith. And if you don't understand the radical nature to our faith, you'll never walk in the fullness of what our faith is. God gives us not divine suggestions. He gives us divine commands, divine commandments to follow. And there's a very intense standard that Jesus sets for us. And I know this is not the fun message that a lot of people want to hear, but it is the most important message you need to receive. There's a moment in the book of Revelation when Jesus speaks to John, and John's writing to the churches, and John makes this statement, and many of you have probably heard this statement, but he says, I know all the things you do, which God knows. He knows every skeleton you think is hidden. He knows everything in your life. God knows your life in public and private. He says that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. That's intense. Like how many people know when you put something in your mouth and it is so unpalatable, you got to spit it out. Like you don't even have the ability to swallow it. That's an intense feeling you have right there. And you're willing to spit it out, and you don't care how lack of manners that looks or what people, like you just got to get it out. That is what God says in reference to lukewarm faith. That's intense. Why would he say that? Why would he say that he would rather you be hot or cold instead of lukewarm? Because being lukewarm in your faith is the most dangerous place to be. When you're cold, you know something's not right in your life. When you're cold in your life, you know you want something better in your life. When you're cold, you know there's a void that needs to be, and you're in search mode. Now, sometimes in that search mode, you're searching for the wrong things. You're searching for the wrong answers, but you're desperate for there to be a solution to that ache in your soul. And this is where God prays that godly believers take their responsibility and faith and, and they plant godly seeds and they water godly seeds because in that searching, if there's such a nurturing of, of godly people in their lives, maybe there they'll understand that the only answer to their solution in their life is Jesus. That's exactly what Bobby said on that testimony, that he tried every answer in the world to solve the coldness in his soul, but it was only on that cold rec room floor that he felt the fire of God actually fill him and move in his life. There's something about being in this place of searching that God can use. And when you're on fire for God, man, you are growing and you're passionate. But here's where lukewarm people are. They're not really that uncomfortable. They can kind of live in their conveniences and they can kind of live in their preferences. And, and you know what? They're not really cold. They're not really hot, but they will just live in the complacency zone. And that is the most dangerous place to be. Why? Because the Bible says the enemy is like a lion seeking those he can devour. And you know how he devours? He devours the one that just strays away far enough isolated from the pack to get them when they're least expecting it. In this lukewarm, this commercial mindset of faith, when you just think your only job is to consume, 
It's in that lukewarmness you are the most susceptible for the attacks of the enemy. That's why God says, I'd rather you hot or cold don't live in the danger zone of being lukewarm. It's an intense statement, he says there. Another intense statement Jesus says, he says it like this in Matthew chapter 10. He says, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. In other gospels, he says, if you don't, if you don't hate your brothers and sisters in comparison to me, you're not worthy of being mine. Like that's an intense statement. He goes on to say, if you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll find it. Like that's intense. Like that's really crazy. Like if you put family above God, you're not worthy of being him. Like some people are listening to that and they're going, Whoa, that's like some cult stuff, right? Like, like, like you got to disregard your whole family and just follow Jesus. Some of you are like new to Bloom. You're like, is this a cult? No, it's not a cult. Now, there is a covenant you're going to sign on the way out. Don't read the small print, okay? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> but that's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying here is if you place anything or person above him, guess what? You're not going to walk in the holiness and the transformation and walk in the freedom that you can only find in God when he is the foundation of your life. And this is the kicker. When you give God your everything, you become a better spouse and a better parent and a better friend and a better leader. Why? Because no longer are you responding out of your bondage and your past hurt and no longer are you walking in the tension of the impurities, but you get a walk in the growth of your freedom, in the growth of the holiness of God, in the growth of who you are. So when you give everything to God, guess what? You're not really giving everything to God. It's not really that big of a sacrifice. Why? Because God gives you so much more in return. He starts pouring the beauty of his holiness in your life. And so Jesus has given you this intense statement. In the very next verse, and this is where, our next chapter, this is where I'm going to hang the whole message on today. He says this. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I'm humble, and I'm gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Again, Jesus gives you a very clear commitment. Take my yoke. Be committed to me. He says, I don't want half-hearted obedience. I don't want half-hearted commitments. Jesus is not asking for part-time Christians. He's asking for full-time disciples. And that is a sacrifice. And that is a very strict choice. But guess what? It's also layered with the most gracious invitation. Anybody can. That is available to all. And everyone can experience the peace and the rest that's only found in Jesus. It is a commitment that few will choose, but it is a commitment everybody has the ability to choose. It is the most grace-filled invitations possible. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, you're going to hear him a couple times today, says it beautifully like this. Grace is costly because it compels a man to submit to the yoke of Christ and follow him. But it is grace because Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's going to cost you your preferences. It's going to cost you to reorganize your priorities. It's going to cost you to be radical with your faith. But it is so grace-filled because there you get a rest and a peace you will never find in all the searching of this world. And so Jesus tells you to do four things in this text, and that's where I'm gonna park. If you're taking notes, write this down. The very first thing he says to you is, you gotta come, we must come. Come to me, all who of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. There has to be a resolution in your soul that Jesus is the only answer to the questions you are searching for. There has to be a resolution in your soul that Jesus is the only way to salvation. 
There has to be a resolution in your soul that Jesus is the only place for freedom and peace and the only place of purpose and fulfillment. There has to be a resolution in your soul that Jesus is who he says he is. You've got to make the choice to come to him. You've got to make the choice to believe he is who he says he is. Jesus' very word says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you believe with every part of your being that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Do you believe the only way to God is through him? Do you believe he is the resurrected king sitting at the right hand of God? Do you believe he's the alpha, the omega, the beginning, and the end? Do you believe he is the bread of life that feeds your soul and the well of water that will never go empty? that nourishes your soul and you'll never thirst or hunger again. Do you believe his yoke is easy or do you think there's other ways for happiness in this world? Now you may never say that publicly with your voice but does your life say something different? Do you believe the answers to happiness in this world is found in that self-help book or that TED talk or that social media influencer, and that entrepreneur that gives you all the little tips and tidbits, or based on how other people interpret you. And none of those things by themselves are incorrect or bad, but they are not the core of who we are as believers in Jesus. Do you believe Jesus is the only solution to your problems, to the weariness of your soul, and the burdens that you're carrying? Jesus' very word says, so if the sun sets you free, you are truly free. But you'll never experience that freedom unless you go to the sun. It does not say you will accidentally stumble upon freedom. It says the sun sets you free. You've got to go to the sun. Isaiah 55, 1 so beautifully says it like this. It says, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. You don't buy the grace of God. It's not the select few that are just happen to be holy enough that gets the benefits of God. That's not the way it works. All who call upon the name of the Lord. All of us, when we walk in the grace of Jesus, are now the inheritance bearers of Abraham. And Abraham's promises are our promises because we are all sons and daughters. Come and take your choice of wine or milk. Guess what? It's all free. This is not just a reference to salvation. This is a reference to the abundant life you can find in Jesus. This is the reference to what you can walk in. That's why Jesus says, I'm going to reread the scripture in Matthew. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, come to me in your perfection. He doesn't say, come to me when you get life figured out. He doesn't say, come to me whenever you don't have the weariness and you don't have the burden. He says, in your weariness and in your burdens, I am the answer to what your soul is wrestling with. Aren't you glad God doesn't wait for you to get your act together before you can come to him? Aren't you glad in all of your sin, in all your mistakes, in all your mess, we have a God that loves you. While we were still sinners, he came. There's so many people that don't believe that. You know so many people will say, have you ever heard that statement? Well, if I walk in that church, I'll get struck down by lightning, right? (laughs) Right? Or some people say, well, when I get my life in order, then I'll come to church. Oh, what lies you believe from the enemy. Come with all your burdens and weariness. He will give you rest. The second thing Jesus asks for you is this. We take. Take my yoke upon you. This word take is an action verb, which means you're going to grab a hold of something and you're going to possess it for yourself. You're going to possess it for yourself. Listen to me very, very clearly. There's a lot of people that will go to Jesus in your weariness. You'll go to Jesus when your life's falling apart. But you know what you won't do? 
You won't take a hold of the promises of God and possess them for yourself. You won't take a hold of the character and nature of God and say that's his character and nature towards you. You won't take a hold of your earthly or, or, or your heavenly identity. What do you do? You take a hold of the yoke of oppression of this world. You take a hold of the yoke of oppression of your past and your shame. You go around in life saying you'll always be what you've always been and there cannot be any change. You'll go around and say I'm always a loser and I'm always a failure and I'm always a mess up or this person will always hurt me and that person will always leave me and that person will always abandon me because that's just the reputation and the story of my life. And what do you do? You choose to take a hold of the lies instead of the promises of God. And you choose to live a life you were never meant to live. He says, take hold my promises. Take hold my nature. And here's the most beautiful thing about God. Like, you can have as much of God as you want. You can have as much of his promises as you want. You can have as much of his love as you want. You can have as much of his grace and mercy as you want. You can have as much of his peace and joy as you want. Like, there is no limit to the fountain flowing grace of Jesus Christ. There's no limit to his goodness in your life. But you've got to choose it and take hold of it. Galatians says it so beautifully. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest if we just don't give up. If you keep taking hold of the yoke of your sin and the yoke of your burdens and the yoke of your weariness, if you keep taking a hold of and holding white knuckle to all your problems and all your pain, you will reap the benefits of death and decay. But if you can take hold of the promises of God and who God says you are, and every day you pray it, and every day you proclaim it, and every day you believe it, that if you don't give up, you'll reap the harvest of abundance in just the right time. You keep speaking it. You keep believing it. You keep praying for it. Take hold of the yoke of Jesus. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. This is very important. If you're not taking notes, jot this down because it's important. What you hold on to becomes your responsibility to maintain. But you surrender to God, he bears. If you keep holding on to your weariness and your burdens and all your pain, all the responsibility of all the weight of this world solely falls on your shoulders You now have to be the one that musters miracles. You now have to be the one that musters happiness. You're the one that has to muster peace. You're the one that has to muster progression in your life. And how many people know you've been muscling through this for so long and all it's done is make you more weary and more burdened and more weighed down because the only way you can see the miracles in your life is if you let go of the bondage of your past and hold on to the promises of who God says he is and what he'll do in your life and how he views you and your identity in him. God always has your best interest at heart. He's your loving father. Don't ever let that slip away. The third thing he tells you to do is we learn. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart. That as you come to Jesus and then you take hold of his promises and you take hold of how he sees you, You're now putting yourself in a posture to learn from him. You're inviting the Holy Spirit. Now this is in this surrendered place. You have a humbled heart where you say, Holy Spirit, I don't have all the answers. And I'm not perfect. And there's a bunch of stuff in my life. And I want my heart to be gentle so you can actually sow your nature into me. You can actually grow your things into me. Holy Spirit, I need you to teach me your ways. I need you to show me the areas of my life I'm not living those ways. It's exactly what David prayed when David prayed, search me. Oh God, know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in my life that offends you and lead me 
along the path of everlasting life. David is just coming to God. And he's like in this desperation, I need you. I don't got what it takes. I'm not, I'm not moral enough without you. I'm not wise enough without you. I'm not strong enough without you. They call me a giant slayer, but I know you're the only giant slayer. They call me the ruler, but I know you're the only true ruler and king. And I need you. And point out anything in my life that's holding me back from the growth and the progression. If anything is contrary to your promises in nature, take it. Reveal it. That's a tough prayer. And I'm going to be honest with you, most people don't want to pray that prayer. Most people, you know what, you know what most people want? They want cheap grace. They don't want true grace. You know what true, cheap grace says? I want forgiveness so I don't get in trouble. I want forgiveness so I don't have to feel the consequences of what I did. I'm going to ask for forgiveness so my wife's not mad at me anymore. I'm going to ask for forgiveness so I don't get in trouble at work. Jesus, I just want your forgiveness so I don't go to hell. That's not true grace. True grace is this humble heart that says, I don't ever want to be that person anymore. I don't ever want to walk in that anymore. I don't ever want to be defined by that anymore. And I have this repented heart that I'm going to turn from that and I'm going to pursue who God called me to create me to be. I am not that person. I am not that weakness. I am not that unhealthy, sinful fruit. I am who God called and created me to be. And I choose to walk away from it. That's the place of freedom. That's true grace. It's exactly what Paul says when he says, God's grace has set us free from the law. Does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can, what's this word? Choose to obey God, which leads to righteousness. You can choose to allow the Holy Spirit to convict you, and you could choose to want to leave that sin and that nature and that bondage of this earthly yoke in the past. It's a choice. Jesus' very word says it like this, if you love me, obey my commands. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying, don't tell me you love me. Show me by the life that you live. Show me you want to grow, and show me you want that in your life. And he says, guess what? I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate who will never leave you he is the Holy Spirit who leads you to all truth, which means you don't have to be the moral person alone, and you don't have to be strong enough alone. Holy Spirit wants to guide you and wants to counsel you and wants to convict you and wants to give you wisdom and, most importantly, wants to give you strength in your life. But you've got to make the choice. It's why we understand worship is not lip service. When we sing worship, it's not just words we recite. It is declarations that our spirit feels because that's the life we live and we're pursue, or we're pursuing to live. We're giving our lives to Jesus, which is worship. That's why Paul says in Romans, he says it like this. He says, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you. He's begging because most people won't. He's begging them because most people, this will be in one ear and out the other. Most people will choose lukewarmness. And he says, I'm pleading, I am begging you, give your bodies to God because all that he's done for you, let them be living and what a holy sacrifice, the kind he finds accessible. This is truly the way to worship him. It's why a part of one of my prayer rhythms, if you've ever been to a prayer service, you've probably heard me pray this. I've taught this before, but I physically go through my body. I, I go through my mind at least once a week, multiple times a week. I'll say, God, and I go through, God, show me thoughts that I've thought that are not of you. And show me things that I've thought that are not aligned with your promises. And I go to my eyes, and, and I say, God, my, what I've seen, I go to my ears, what I've heard, I go to my mouth, what have I spoken? I go to my heart, God, like, 
Like, well, I want to be broken for what you're broken for. I want to be passionate about what you're passionate for. I want to hunger for what you hunger for. I go to my hands. I don't, I don't want to build the kingdom of me. I want to build the kingdom of you. And, and I pray this on a regular basis because it's so easy to want to build the kingdom of you. And I said, give you my feet. I'll go wherever you want me to go. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to posture myself to allow the Holy Spirit to teach me and to reveal things in my life that's hindering me from where I'm supposed to go. So you come, you take, you learn, and the last thing is we receive his rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Listen to me very clearly. If salvation is the only rest you receive, what a sad way to live life. If the only rest you think you'll receive is when you die one day and you're in heaven, what a sad way to live life. There are way too many believers that go to heaven broken with all the burdens and the weariness of this world. God wants you to walk in freedom. Why do you choose weariness? Why do you choose the burdens of this world when you can walk in the rest that only he can give you? Why don't you come to him and let him be the answer to every one of your soul's problems? Why don't you take a hold of his promises and you speak it into your life day in and day out? Why don't you lean in and allow the Holy Spirit to show you and reveal and lay out any preference that would hold you back from growth and give it to him so that you can discover the rest that is only found in him? Now let me be very clear. This does not mean that Life is easy when you become a Christian. We all live in a fallen world. We all are surrounded by fallen people. We all feel the residue of sin. But this is the beauty of the promises of God, is when the enemy and the fallenness of this world tries to weigh you down, Every single time you can come and you can take and you can learn and you can rest. Every day you can come, take, you can learn, you can rest. Every month you can come, take, learn, and rest. For decades upon decades you can come, take, learn, and rest. Why? Because the faithful Lord, uh, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercy never ceases. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin for us each single morning. There's never a limit to God's love. There's never a limit to his freedom. There's never a limit to his grace. I'm going to answer one question left and I'm done. But it's a question that some of us might be asking as you've been hearing this message. What is a yoke? You talk about yoke, I don't even know what that is. I wanted to end with it because the yoke is such a multifaceted symbol. It's what makes this moment Jesus is teaching so profound. It doesn't just mean one thing. It has so much relevant areas of our life. The first part of what this means is, in those days, the people of Israel were not a free nation. They were conquered, they were controlled by the Roman government. There was a term that would always be spoken, you were under the yoke of the mighty Roman Empire, which means you were under their power and their control. There was a moment whenever the people of Israel, when they thought the Messiah was coming, they thought that there would be deliverance from the yoke of the Roman Empire. But what did Jesus say? He says, I did not come to build a kingdom of earthly kingdoms. I came to build a heavenly kingdom. What he's referencing is that people have been under the yoke of sin and the oppression of sin. 
and they have been bound by their addictions, bound by their carnal nature, bound by the sin that has held them back. But there is a new yoke that is a yoke of freedom, that is a yoke that is only found in the death and the resurrection of a resurrected king that is the ultimate sacrifice that says the old you is gone and the new you is here and your sin is not just pardoned but washed clean and the, the yoke of your sin has been broken because Jesus holds the keys to death, hell, and the grave and he saw the devil fall like lightning in defeat. That is the yoke he breaks you from. The second symbol is that in many times, that yoke would be a yoke that was not an individual yoke you would carry, but it was a yoke that would yoke or put two animals together to plow fields or do work. They were tied together. They were unified. They were in harmony, and they were on mission together. And there is a beautiful thing in this symbol that Jesus says. He says, when you come underneath my freedom and my grace, and you give me your life, there is a yoking, a uniting between me and you. And the things that break my heart, I want them to break yours. And the passions that are in my heart, I want them to be passionate you. And I want to share the burden together because you are my hands and feet in this world. You are my ambassadors in this world. You are the representation of heaven. You are the imitators of Christ. Let's be yoked together and be on mission together. The very last words Jesus spoke in A.D. 33, nine years from the 2,000-year anniversary of these words, he said it like this. He said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And watch this. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of age. Jesus says we have a mandate, church, that we have the keys that we can unlock people's depression and unlock their burdens and weariness and bondage. We can plow the fields of hearts that are ready to harvest the kingdom of God in their lives. But we've got to be the mouthpiece of Jesus. We're not consumer Christians. We are the contrib contributors of the body of Christ. We go, we make, we baptize, we teach, we go, we make, we baptize and teach. And guess what? Jesus is with us every step of the way. His power, his authority, his freedom, his spirit, his nature. Are we going to be on mission with Jesus? Are we going to go all in with Jesus? The third thing that is so beautiful about the yoke is that when you are yoked with another, guess what you can't do? You can't look backwards. You can't look backwards. You can only move forward. I ain't going back to old me. I ain't going back to those old devices. I ain't going back to those old mentalities. I am moving forward to the person Jesus has me. And every day I get a little bit closer. And every day I get a little bit more free. And every day I get more growth in my life. Jesus' very word said it like this. Anyone who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus is desperate for people that are willing to say, I'm all in. And Jesus is asking the very stark question, the very question he asked Peter, when hundreds of his followers, maybe thousands, left him and said, we're not willing to be all in. We're not willing to be radical. And he looks at Peter and says, will you go also? And Peter said, where else would I go? You're it. Your words are the only truth. You are who you say you are. And I feel like Jesus is asking, boom, are you willing to be like Peter and say, where else would I go? Are you going to be like the crowds that walk away when it gets a little bit inconvenient and a little bit difficult and when it's going to cost you some of your preferences? Which one do you want to be? Do you want to be the, the crowds or do you want to be the one that says, where else will I go? I give you my life. And the last symbol of yoke is that whenever a rabbi would teach, every rabbi would have their own 
thoughts or interpretations of the Word of God. Much like today, that's why there's denominations. Everybody, everybody has a preference on how they interpret things sometimes. And when you would follow a rabbi, what you would say is, I follow his yoke or I receive his yoke. And Jesus is saying very clearly, receive my yoke. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law, I came to fulfill it. Jesus is the thread from Genesis to Revelation that ties the entire word of God together. And listen to me very clearly. How can you hear the word of God if you don't read the word of God? How can you know the promises of God and take hold of that yoke if you do not consume the word of God and the promises of God? How can you get the benefits of a child of God if you do not know the benefits of a child of God? The word of God has to be your daily bread. Every day you need it in your life. And I'm not telling you you have to read 37 chapters a day or memorize books of the Bible. What I am telling you is every day you need to nourish your soul because it's hungry for spiritual nutrients. Whether that's five minutes a day or 20 minutes a day, do not rob your soul of the promises and the nature and the words of God or you will spiritually deteriorate at a very rapid pace. I'm gonna end with this quote, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Remember I told you he's coming back. When we are called to follow Christ, we are summoned to an exclusive attachment to his person. And Christianity, without discipleship, is always Christianity without Christ. You are called to be attached to his nature and his will and his plans. And a Christian that does not desire to grow is a Christian that is trying to navigate their faith without Jesus a part of it. It will only live in, lead you to bankruptcy. You've got to make him a priority. Prayer has to be as natural to you as breathing. The word of God has to be daily your nutrients. You need to surround yourself with like-minded believers. You've got to get in small groups where people know your name and you guys can grow in relationships together. Your faith is not a solo venture and every single time you think you can get through it by yourself, the weariness will hold you back. You need to use your gifts, not for selfish gain, but for the kingdom of God, because one day you'll stand before God one day, and the greatest thing you could ever hear is, well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm telling you right now, you want to know what the greatest joy in your life will? Wait till the creator of the world tells you, well done. But the start is giving your life to Jesus. The start is committing your life to Jesus. And there's two groups of people in this room right now. The first group of people are people that are heaven bound, but they are still carrying the yoke of this world. You're not tied to Jesus. You're that lukewarmness. And God is asking you to turn up the heat in your life. Start being boiling and spilling over into the lives of this world around you. Go all in. But there's also a group of people in this room that does not know Jesus at all. You don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you never have. Maybe you have in the past, but you've walked away. And you know right now that you're not living a correct life. And it's time to come back home. And you may say, how do I give my life to Jesus? It's very simple. The Bible, all the Bible says you have to do is you have to confess with your mouth. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Come be a part of my life. I give you my life. You just say it. But the second part is very, very important you got to believe Jesus is who he says he is. He's not rotting in a grave somewhere. He's the resurrected king. And when you pray, guess what? He hears your prayers and responds to your prayers immediately. And you may say that sounds too easy. Good. Grace was never meant to be hard, just chosen. Your God's already chosen you. Now you just got to choose him. So I'm asking everybody to bow your heads. Nobody looking around and please no moving. It's the most important thing we do. Take your hand and place over your heart symbol of your soul. We're going to pray this prayer together as a family. And if you need to receive Jesus in your life, know your Jesus is hearing and responding to these prayers. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, 
I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. And I believe your blood washes away all sins. Come be a part of my life. I am forgiven. I am chosen. I matter. And I give you my life. Holy Spirit, move right now in the name of Jesus. Every head bowed, nobody looking around. If you made that commitment today for the first time or recommitted your life to Jesus, in just a second, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. You may say, why do you want me to raise my hand? Two reasons. Number one, in this house, we're not ashamed of Jesus. We celebrate those that come a part of our family of faith. And there's a party in heaven, and I'm ready to join that party and celebrate with all the angels rejoicing you came home. But number two, I want to pray for you this week. And I want to see the picture of your hand in my mind as I'm praying. Your pastor wants to go to battle for you. So on the count of three, I want to see hands all over this place raised. One, don't be afraid. Two, we going to celebrate. Three, get your hands up right now. See your hands, 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 see your hands. Come on, church. See your hand right there, see your hand right there. Come on, church. Get excited. Heaven got bigger. Hell got smaller. I don't ever take that moment for granted. And I am so honored you let me share this special moment with you. This means you believed in Jesus, you're heaven bound. We're going to be in heaven together. Thank you for watching. And if you gave your heart to Jesus, can I tell you right now, I am so excited for you. And this church wants to be in your corner. We actually want to resource you so you can grow in your faith. So if you text the number below, we actually want to send you a free digital copy of the book, Following Jesus. It's going to help answer some questions you may have and give you some next steps you need to take to grow in your relationship with Jesus. Again, thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed today's message, will you give me a favor? We like this video, comment below, maybe share it with a friend. And don't forget, we go live every single Sunday. And until next time, pray God's peace.